Hello and welcome to History by the Pint, a new podcast series that covers all things history and archaeology in the time it takes to drink a pint. My name is Alex Rosen, I'm a TV producer and author, and with me as always is Glyn Davis, a curator at Colchester Castle Museum, and Chris Shavitsky, a lecturer and researcher in Rome. In this episode, Glyn's going to be taking us on a journey down the ancient Amber Road. For many years now, whenever Chris or I have come across an interesting amber artefact, be it during our research or on a museum visit, we've inevitably alerted Glynn. And that's because Glynn has a long-standing fascination with this fossilised pine resin and has spent much time delving into its history. And now is our chance to find out more. So Glynn, what was it about amber that first got you hooked? Well, I suppose it was discovering uh, an amber... Roman amber object, um, which was really unique, a tiny Roman amber dice. And that was when I worked for the Museum of London in their archaeological archive. And I mean, that place is is packed to the rafters of, of Roman material. And it was just through sort of just the course of my normal day-to-day job that I suddenly came across this and didn't quite work, couldn't quite work out what it was. I was like, oh, it's, it's down as Roman. And I tried to sort of verify it. And after that, I just got hooked because I suddenly found out that there is so little of this really important material to the Romans in Britain. It's so, you know, I just got hooked on researching, you know, what would that have meant? Why is it here? And that sort of opened up this world of exploring Roman amber uh, and where it came from, where it was worked and, and what it meant over the centuries. When you you found it in the storerooms, because I remember you very kindly let me into the storerooms one day and nothing went missing. But uh, <laughs> you 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 like you were just getting out various things, bits and pieces, and you got an entire box of Roman dice. Was it in amongst all of the the bone and ivory dice? No, or it had already been categorised. This is separate. This is different. Yeah, it was it was part of a, what we call the the archaeological archive. So when an excavation takes place, the archive is sort of all the material and all the records of that excavation, and it's uh, archived in such a way that anyone could come in and, and look at that and re- indeed reinterpret the site if they wanted to. So it's a record of everything. And what's interesting is this object uh, this amber dice wasn't published and so we i came for it through sort of routine work or documenting and updating this one site which is where it's called gpo 75 so it was the site of the old general post office and the excavation took place in 1975 so that's how a site code works so it's a fascinating site and yeah loads of this material just not published because they didn't do that at the time and there it was amongst all these other yeah fascinating fascinating roman objects actually amazing archive I mean, just to say that day, sorry, in the, the archive was incredible. And you open this box, and it's literally a box full of Roman dice. And well, I was I, working I, on I mean, a I've, Roman I've dice found, project. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, even so, like, I've never found a Roman dice on excavation. I think I got a bit of a bone comb or something like that. And then <laughs> it's just like, well, yeah. if you found a dice, you'd be like, oh, that's really, really cool. And then you'd be like, well, I've got a whole box. But yeah, if, if you've got an amber dice, though, I mean, that must mean you're a pretty nifty player, right? Or you maybe in a gambling house. Which is <laughs> yeah, pretty, so, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I wrote, That's I wrote an unusual material for... Oh, you, you, so, well, yeah, so you did further research into it. What, what did yeah, you find out I about mean, it? I mean, I probably shared the article with you and you both either didn't read it or you, <laughs> you can't remember <laughs> I it. Look, I definitely <laughs> looked at it. <laughs> it. It was a long time ago, Glenn. Remind us, remind us. So I, I argued this was for a, um, a volume looking at um, Roman magic in Britain, especially, and the materiality of magic. The Romans believed it had these magical properties, and we know this because there are f- many different authors that talk about it. And, and it was believed to be a magical material, so materia magica, even before the Roman period, going back sort of uh, pre-Roman, Etruscan, Italic, uh, and then into sort of Hellenistic culture too, and even before then, so the Mycenaean culture. Amber has always really fascinated those sort of uh, Mediterranean cultures. And the Romans believed, you know, it was um, curative, it had all these um, medicinal properties, it could cure all these different things. And they also believed it protected against, I suppose, evil forces. They believed in this concept of the evil eye and the, the personification, if you like, of envy. And if that was attracted to you, bad things would come. So I was arguing that 
yeah, this would have had a really special place. Bearing in mind, you know, it, it looks dark red now, but originally, again, it would have had that lovely translucent yellowy red uh, colour. Really special. And it would have been, you know, when someone whips that out to play their games, you know, that's going to be really special. Well, and it's going to be, I'm not going to play against you because you've got your magic <laughs> dice. Well, your magic yeah. dice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I sort of ran with, I ran with, you know, this would have been a, a, a magic lucky dice, you know. I should say all the all the pips on opposite sides, as Roman dice do, like modern day dice, add up to seven. So it wasn't weighted. It didn't have the pips in some different arrangement. It is a, you know, it's a standard, as we say, dice. But I think it's material. And again, you think of what amber does. So in the hand, if you start to rub it, maybe it kind of elicited that kind of that pine scent that amber produces. You smell it, yeah. So you know, if you think of magic, you know, you're you're engaging with the object. It's reacting to you you a scent is given off you know so a big thing on like fumigants in in roman magic yeah all of these sort of uh, manifestations uh, and ways of experiencing if you want to call it the magic and then doing a role and then you get well, snake eyes or whatever it was go to monte carlo where i spend my wednesday mornings and you see them shaking the dice and then <sighs> blow on it isn't it or you you get you get someone else to blow on it apparently yeah um, and then you chuck away the amber <laughs> dice and it's found you know two thousand years yeah, later yeah, on the be, side be, of the post be, office because yeah. you know it, it was craps so 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 this this little dice took you down a bit of a rabbit hole then into the whole magical world of amber in in the roman empire and and before and beyond i've often been quite intrigued by by this term the amber road where does that uh, come from I'm not sure if it's something that's projected back because we can talk about it now. There's always been uh, an amber road or route, especially from the Baltic, if you like, the Baltic coastline. So it's where modern day Poland and Lithuania are, especially. And the concept of yeah, this material coming from there and, and, and traveling down. And the amber, there was many different amber routes or amber roads over time. In the Roman period, it kind of kicks off again in the first century where the, the Romans sort of, sort of finally make contact beyond the limes of the, the empire. So that's kind of like the, the edge of its territory and into what we call barbaricum. That's where the Germanic peoples are. But, you know, there, there were amber roots definitely before that. Yeah, because you think about the amber object, you know, they go back to the Mesolithic, right? The, these little yeah, um, amber figurines of wild animals and things. So absolutely. this material obviously has been incredibly highly sought after. Um, but why do you think that is? What is it about amber that you think gives it this sort of magical property? Well, first of all, it's the optics of it, I think. You know, fresh, fresh amber is, and I'm talking about Baltic amber here as well, because there are, there are deposits all across the world of amber. I think even in Britain, actually. Um, and it, it's all different. It comes in all different shades and colours. I think something like over 250. But the Baltic is producing a, a huge amount of what is Sussanite uh, uh, amber. And um, this is what the Romans are, are trading in and, and bringing in and, and working. And it's what they love. And it's, you know, when, when it's sort of uh, freshly acquired and it hasn't weathered over time, it should be a lovely sort of light yellowy, yellowy red colour. And that transforms over time. It reacts. It just naturally does that as, a, as an organic gemstone over time. And it darkens in colour and it becomes redder, reddy brown even and opaque and it can even get this crazing or cracking it develops a patina if you like a crust on the surface and that's what you see with this little amber dye from london it's got them almost sort of whitey crust over it so it's completely different to what it once would have been but this is what the romans uh love they love the, this 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 um form and type of amber um yeah, and they're trading it all the way down. It kind of comes along this route. So down, for the most part, through what is now Poland, comes to Carnuntum, which is a, a city on the on the sort of on the Limes, I suppose, in modern day Austria. So that's a transshipment terminal. So they found huge amounts coming through there from Roman context where they've done excavation. And then it eventually comes into northeast Italy and to um, a city, a huge city, a really important city called uh, Aquilia. Uh, which is on sort of northeast of Italy on the Adriatic coast. And Aquilia is just amazing. I mean, it's such a rich place and it's essentially an emporium because it's having, you know, not just amber coming through, all sorts of materials are coming through. And it's also producing stuff, glass work, metal work, precious stones, as well as amber being worked here. It's it's a phenomenal place, actually. It would have been a phenomenal place in Roman times. Um, 
And so what the, 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 the arm is coming in then to, to, to this place and it's being worked and then that's being distributed across the empire in its finished form. Absolutely. I think lots have been di- distributed out. But when we get to places like Britain, I think little objects are coming with people. You know, we're on the fringe of this this network in the first century. So that's the amber boom when this really kicks off and it kicks off as, at, at Aquilia. And it sort of, that run goes to about the third century and it stops at Aquilia because of several wars that happen. And we think the centre of production maybe moves to somewhere like Cologne or around there, although not on the same scale. And I actually think uh, it's probably been worked again along those Danubian provinces still, you know, because Baltic still got to cut, the, the Baltic Amber still got to come through sort of the same way, but they are working it sort of near Cologne and elsewhere there. So yeah, it's, it has a really wide distribution, Italy especially. And Italy is probably one of the main c- consumers. And there are just fantastic objects. I mean, you can't work incredibly large pieces uh, of amber, although it's a soft material and is easy to work, I suppose. It does, it fractures conchoidally. That's a bit like how glass fractures. And if it has natural inclusions, you can kind of hit a break and that sort of thing. So you can't make massive things. I mean, this is interesting because we hear of, I'm sure, is it Pausanias? Uh, you know you know about him, Alex. He's, he's Greek. Yeah, he? the walker, um, the great walker in, uh, Greece. in Greece. I'm sure yeah, he talks yeah. of a statue to, I think it's Zeus, maybe at Olympia, made of amber. But you... When this is said, you have to think about how that was constructed. Was that one entire huge statue, so a cult statue in a temple? Probably not. I imagine it was many, many elements fitting together because, A, you just wouldn't find a piece of amber that large. You know, the Romans aren't mining this. Well, the Romans aren't doing anything. It's the the peoples in, you know, the Baltic who are acquiring this and then trading it. You know, naturally, it's it's being eroded from the seabed, so you're what you can make is dictated by the size of the natural piece coming out of the sea and being acquired and then how you can work it without fracturing it i suppose so really a lot of the stuff they're making is tiny little things that have been consumed by you know I suppose the elites of rome in the early first century you get loads of um you know beads and necklaces you know women at this point love to wear amber finger rings which are incredibly ornate they have these amazing busts on and you can think of the early empresses with these amazing hairstyles they have the the bus almost sitting on the ring and you wonder how they even wore these things you know i don't know how that would fit on your ring and not fall off or how you could use your hand but maybe that's the point maybe that's a symbol status you know i'm wearing things on my hands i don't have to use my hands yeah i'm dripping yeah. in amber um <laughs> and you know pliny of course so pliny who writes his natural history has something to say about this. So Pliny has something to say about everything, but he also has something to say about it because he's always having a dig. And I think at the, when he describes um, amber, he says it's so popular, it's become the sort of third hair colour. People want their hair to be amber coloured, just like Nero's wife, I think he says. Well, I was going to ask, it, I was going to ask if, if your interest in amber came from the colour of your beard. <laughs> Maybe I'm just naturally drawn to it. <laughs> I tried to come up with an elaborate, meaningful, yeah, professional an, an kind reason. of yeah. reason. Chris, Chris reduces it. I didn't interrupt for like 10 minutes because you were saying some interesting stuff, but I've been meaning to ask it for a, for a while. Was amber then quite a rare substance or quite an expensive substance? Or do you think there was, uh, you know, a sort of status relation with actually who had these things and who didn't? I think so. I mean, it's it's Pliny again. I should say so. Pliny in his his natural history. That's the the huge volume of work he he writes on pretty much anything. If you want to know something about the ancient Roman world, you start there, don't you? And he says, you know, um, a figurine of amber is worth more than several. He's he's referring to enslaved people. So well, so whatever the cost of a slave is in Roman times, you know, he's saying a tiny figurine is is you know. Is worth a lot more, although he's writing at the time of the. How many slaves then was a? Uh, sing- he said several, several. Several slaves several for slaves. one amber so, figurine. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But he's writing at the time of the amber boom as well, when it's just been set up. The stuff's coming in, you know. So, you know, value changes, doesn't it? In fact, you know, amber I think keeps its value. But it is interesting when you look at tiny little things. Some things not crafted, um, you know, as well are still being made, and I suppose. You know, even a tiny fragment of this stuff can be turned into something that has meaning and therefore value. It has all types of value beyond monetary. You know, it has, as we've been talking about, magical value too, which is is maybe worth even more. I mean, the perception was, you know, 
that this could cure you in some ways. That's what Pliny, what Pliny's recounting. You know, it, it's, it has mass appeal. But yeah, whether you've got the, the cash, especially in the first century, mid-first century or just after. Where are we finding most of the amber in terms of, uh, is it cropping up in in necropolises and in graves? Where, where are we getting the objects? It's exactly that, actually, Chris. Yeah, I think archaeologically uh, we're finding it for the most part in, in, in burials. Exactly that. You do get it in other contexts as well, but certainly from um, Britain and elsewhere, it's grave assemblages. So that's interesting in itself, actually. It's it's Pliny who says, you know, amber is really popular with women and young children, especially, say, infants. And it's interesting that we're a literary source here. Um, marries up with our archaeological evidence because we do find in graves where you can sex the biologically sex the skeleton that these are these are for the most part females and young children every now and again you'll find a man but if you look at the stats this is a kind of uh, gendered material um, which is fascinating is there any mythology about why amber might have a sort of protective quality i mean why is it being found in the graves of women and children specifically well, I think there might be something, you know, it's, it's the reality, you know, it's the evidence says that. And I don't think people have looked to Amber's mythical origins, even though it's it's well described. And that's, um, in fact, we have the source. So we have Ovid, the Roman poet Ovid. He writes his Metamorphoses. So that's all about changes. And one does sort of give the origins, if you like, the mythical origins of Amber. And it's where, uh, is it Phaeton? Phaeton, I think, is sort of uh, falls from the skies, defeated, and his sisters, the the Heliades, they start to weep for him, and they are transformed into poplar trees. Uh, so it goes, and as uh, their tears run down their faces, and they slowly turn into amber. And this is really interesting. I mean, you can debate the the reality of all of this. It's it's a myth, of course, and the type of tree, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what this does show is that, but the ancients, the Romans understood what amber was that is this this resinous thing it's and it's a very strange material it's another thing i think that makes it magical that it was once soft you know sap like and then it becomes fossilized which is hard i mean this this is really interesting stuff but they associated with that and i think it's the fact that they the heliades weep these tears you know that maybe makes it you know a gendered sort of material i suppose and i think it's is it Diodorus Siculus, Chris, you're the one who knows all this. Diodorus Siculus. That there you go. Thank you. He actually he actually states, you know, uh, that the tears of the Heliades. I think of he calls it the, of the black poplars are used in the mourning of women and and children. So he specifically gives a mourning context. So I think a lot of these objects, you know, are, are used throughout life. Just because we're finding amber objects in graves, I don't think the workshops are outputting this stuff to go directly into the grave. I mean, that could happen and that's important. You know, what you, you gift on to the burial for that person and protection in the next world, I suppose. But, you know, we do find use wear, what we call archaeologists called use wear on these objects. They are being used, they're being worn, you know, they're being rubbed to maybe um, uh, evoke the magic. Um, And so I think they are kind of worn and used in life as well as, in death, and so there is, but there is clearly this this concept there of of these tears, these tears of mourning, and amber being almost, if you like, solid tears, I suppose, that can then be placed in like, the yeah, grave. divine, divine tears, yeah, yeah, tears from the gods, yeah. I think what's quite interesting about these amber amulets is that it's trying to get back into the ancient mindset, isn't it? Because if they had magical properties, if they were worn by certainly young children, you can imagine the need, the um, the want for some sort of protection with the amount of disease and what was it, you know, one child in, in every three died from some sort of disease before they reached adult, adulthood or something like that. And I guess any sort of superstition, any sort of material that you can get, especially if you've got the money, that might protect you know, such a precious person in your life would be worth that money. And I can understand how that superstition grows. And obviously there's some people maybe taking advantage of that, you know, the amber traders and, and whatnot. But I think it's always important to try and think back into that ancient mindset of, of the realities of the time. And, and yeah, it's beautiful substance. And we like, you know, these different figurines, but fundamentally it was the material, right? That, that they thought had this protective apotropaic role and that's why they were wearing it so, so just to say sorry sorry just before glenn 
it's not that the amber traders are taking advantage of it. They might see themselves as facilitating as well. I, th- I think that's absolutely it. Yeah, they're meeting a demand. You've essentially summed it up, haven't you, Alex? There is demand. You know, there's, there's huge infant mortality. You know, disease and illness is everywhere. And if you can't afford access to, let's say, medicine that will heal you, because there's certainly medicine there, but that, that could do more worse than good, maybe. Or you can't get access to, you know, whatever doctors and surgeons, which there were in the Roman world, yeah, you're going to rely on on these things. And it doesn't even have to be expensive amber amulets. It it could be made of bone, wood. I think of all these organic materials that are making little charms and talismans and amulets. This sort of everyday magic, if you like, that pervaded society at this time just to try and protect you. And that is sort of completely lost in the archaeological records. Um, a lot of the time, these organic materials don't survive. And it's funny because amber itself is is organic and it doesn't survive well, you know, as, as discussed. So, um, yeah. Are there any sort of physical properties that amber has that, that sort of gives it this magical reputation? Yeah, well, I think there's quite a few, actually. And they're all noted by ancient Roman authors. So they know amber... Um, you know, it's really weird. It, it, it soft and becomes hard. It is, you know, a fossilised resin and they understand this and they understand this because it has inclusions in it, like little, you know, bugs and things. This is where you two the say Jurassic, Jurassic Park. Park. Yeah, Jurassic, yeah, yeah. Jurassic Park, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, and also, I suppose what's really important is it's, it's a poor conductor and it's electrostatic. So that means it can take a charge, much like, you know, if you rub a balloon on your head, there's a charge there and you can stick the balloon to the wall. So, you know, that's that's kind of invisible magic. If you can rub a piece of amber and it can generate and pull things towards it. And that's and that's kind of a kind of known. You know, the the Greeks, I think the Greek word for amber is, is electron, and I'm sure it's Homer that uses the word and, and references amber in this way, and it's where we sort of get electricity from. And that must be a, a property that's sort of... I am, I'm going gonna, gonna to test this. I am going to find a piece of amber <laughs> and rub it on something and see what gets attracted towards it, because th- th- that... If... Mate, you can rub all the amber you like on you, and no one's going to be attracted to you. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Ah, ah, burn. There we go. Uh, uh, <laughs> burn, amber yeah. burn. Um... Well, so that's been a really fascinating uh, trip down the Amber Road there, Glenn. Thanks so much for telling us more about that. Um, And next time around, I think Chris is going to be talking to us. Uh, We're not too sure about what yet. We'll wait to see. Uh, But good stuff, guys. Then we've all finished our pints now. So, um, yeah, thanks very much, Glenn, and uh, we'll see you later. No worries. Thanks, guys. See ya. Cheers.